thanks, uh, Suzette, for emphasizing that very important point and a, a sort of nice introduction to, to Peter. Welcome uh, from, from Geneva. And um, in your role, uh, perhaps to reflect on these funding issues, but also some of the global moves that have happened over the past year and where you see, like, have we sort of inculcated these lessons from the Ebola outbreak and uh, is the world better sort of equipped to put forward an integrated and sustained response to for pandemic preparedness? Thank you. And um, just before I go further, I just want to check everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm um, unable to be um, with you. Um, before, before I get to your um, specific question, just uh, an observation um, reflecting on the very helpful remarks of the earlier speakers. Um, I come from an economics background, and one of the things that strikes me is that if you've done any behavioral economics, you wouldn't be at all surprised about the cycle of panic and neglect. I mean, what behavioral economics teaches us is that humans are very bad at, and human institutions are very bad at dealing with low probability, high impact risks. We either overreact to them or we massively underreact to them, which is the case here. Uh, secondly, we're very susceptible to what they call the availability heuristic, uh, which means that if something is right in front of us with a vivid story, we get very excited about it. And conversely, if it isn't, we don't. And thirdly, um, that we are all susceptible to over-optimism. Structurally, we are more over-optimistic than we should be. Now, if you combine those three in thinking about infectious disease outbreaks, it, it adds up to your cycle of panic and neglect. So we need to find sort of structural and institutional ways of um, dealing with them. And I think we have made progress since the um, last um, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, Obviously, the launch of the JEE um, and things like the GHS index being put forward by people like NTI and John Hopkins and the Economist Intelligence Unit are ways of institutionalizing and making transparent both the risks and the degrees of um, preparedness. And I, I do think that is a significant um, uh, step forward. Um, there have been a fair number of um, economic analyses of um, the risks of infectious disease outbreaks, and I've been involved um, in some of these. However, I think we are less in less of a good place there um, in terms of institutionalizing them. Um, ad hoc economic analyses of you know how much a big influenza epidemic is going to cost us aren't terribly useful unless unless they are incorporated in the mainstream macroeconomic analyses that drive policymaker decisions. As yet, that is more the exception than the rule. And it tends to only happen when an incident has happened. And somehow or other, we need to get um, the risk of outbreaks factored into economic policy making in the same way that we factor in other kinds of um, risks to the economy. Um, and that, if we succeed in that, will drive a different perspective on um, investment. What I would say is we have made baby steps towards that since the West African Ebola outbreak, but we still have uh, a ways to go. Um, what is interesting, though, is um, the way the global health community is now thinking about how it needs to work together and achieve multiple objectives through different institutions with different mandates um, working together. And this is the whole point of the Global Action Plan for SDG3 that 11 big multilaterals um, just signed up to. And I am struck in this conversation how little the Sustainable Development Goals plays a part of this discussion when it takes place in the US versus it taking place um, in Europe. If this discussion was taking place in Berlin or London or Geneva, or indeed in some of the capitals, in some of the more vulnerable places in the world, um, you would hear much more about the, the SDG context. Um, and I think that's an important context because it, it reminds you that you can't look at any of these things in their isolation. The big problem 
with the Ebola outbreak in DRC at the moment is not the sort of technical limitations of the vaccines or the strategies, but the fact that where it's running riot is in an area where there is violence and we can't actually um, intervene um, uh, effectively. The other, the, the other reason this broader context is important, um, and this has been brought home to me um, very vividly um, um, in my new role, is, as has been said by um, uh, previous speakers, particularly Suzette just now, um, it's local capability that is absolutely key. And if we want um, people to, if we want officials in local communities in the more vulnerable places in the world to invest in preparedness, we have to have a, a concept of global of health security that makes sense to them. And the concept of health security that we are often promulgating um, doesn't make sense because basically it's a concept that says we want you to invest money in diseases that might kill your people while not investing sufficiently in diseases that are killing your people. It is very difficult if you are a local official to prioritize in a place, say, where malaria is the leading killer of children in the naught to five to prioritize sort of potential threats over the fact that you're losing um, large numbers of people, large numbers of children, for example, to malaria, or you have high levels of stunting, or all sorts of different immediate problems. It just kind of doesn't work, both from a political point of view, and I would argue from an ethical um, uh, point of view. And to put this, put this in context, I mean, Ebola I, I, I don't want to diminish the threat of Ebola at all. Ebola is a horrible, threatening disease. Um, Ebola in DRC, the current outbreak, has killed about 200 people and has mobilized an enormous amount of effort and attention. In the same time, something around 20,000 people have died in DRC of malaria. Um, so if you're going to convince people to prioritize over malaria, uh, Ebola over malaria in DRC, it's a pretty uphill battle. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues I think we have is that we need to have a concept of health security um, that encompasses and the diseases that are killing people now um, in the places that are most vulnerable. And that we, you know, the way you can do this is by doing things to fight the current diseases that actually build the capacities, whether they're disease surveillance, frontline um, uh, health worker capacities, diagnostic labs or whatever, that simultaneously provide the sort of contingency and resilience capability um, to deal with um, outbreaks. At the moment, I don't think um, we are doing that. Uh, institutions like mine um, have been guilty of, and we are, um, I, I'm picking on malaria just simply because we are uh, nearly 60% of external funding on malaria. Um, uh, we, are, we are guilty of not thinking smartly enough about how the things we can do um, to fight malaria can be used to achieve uh, a broader health security objective. And that's one of the things I'm uh, looking at right now. Um, but it's also the case that um, sometimes I think the health security people come in, frankly, fairly um, uh, tin-eared, um, you know, not listening to the fact that um, there are other more pressing health security problems on people's plates um, than the ones that um, the health security um, uh, people are, are focused on. And then I pick malaria simply because it's a, a, a disease that is killing um, a lot of people in some of the more vulnerable countries. But the same could be true of um, uh, TB. I mean, the answer to a big chunk of the MA, AMR problem is dealing with TB. Um, it's currently responsible um, for a third of the deaths um, uh, due to AMR. Um, uh, and yet, actually, the amount of money that we're spending um, uh, in the world on TB are, are ridiculously small. Um, so uh, that, I think, is, is the, the single biggest point I would want to make is that we have to, ha we have to think about health security in the way that it makes sense to people on the ground if we want people to take action on the ground, which is where it matters most. Lastly, I'll just comment quickly. Um, Suzette made the point about um, uh, businesses. 
I think this is also a, a, an underleveraged um, uh, point of uh, action. Most businesses are blissfully aware of how vulnerable they are to infectious disease risk. Um, I had the sort of mixed blessing of running a company that had its largest business in Hong Kong, and we had SARS, was the only, um, was the largest foreign investor in Korea when we had MERS, um, and um, was the only international bank um, uh, present in the bit of West Africa where there was Ebola. So we got a sort of um, disproportionate degree of experience. And what we realized is that things fall apart really, really quickly, um, because you get the net impact of a lot of different things happening. Staff can't turn up, uh, customers won't come, um, supply chains fall apart. Um, and so one of the things I'm doing, sort of wearing my Harvard hat, is working with the World Economic Forum on a report that will come out literally within a couple of weeks, um, uh, trying to um, uh, engage companies to, be, to think more systematically uh, about the nature of their exposures. And this is partly because I think it's important that companies do it, and partly because the more they get engaged in this and think about it, the more they'll become advocates for having better preparedness, because it, they will see the logic of it um, and um, argue for it. I think I will stop that. Thank you.